Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer has arrived in theatres, and after watching the film multiple times already, I think it's a cinematic masterpiece. The director has effortlessly combined large and small scale filmmaking in this highly important historical tale, and when I think about every element of it, whether it be the performances, the story, the cinematography, the score, and so on, it ticks all the boxes. It really did grab me from the very beginning and took me on this tense and sweeping tale of Oppenheimer's troubled life. And even after reading the book that it's based on, there were plenty of surprises both cinematically, structurally, and in the overall context of the portrayal. So in this video, I'm going to be listing the main reasons why I think Oppenheimer is a cinematic masterpiece. This video essay will contain spoilers, so if you do happen to be someone who hasn't seen the film yet, then I would recommend watching this video after you've seen it, or you can check out my spoiler free review which I posted the other day. Before I get into it though, if you want to keep up to date on any of my upcoming content for the film, then don't forget to support this upload by giving it a like rating, subscribing to the channel, and turning on your notifications. But without further ado, let's dive into my thoughts on why I believe Oppenheimer is a classic Nolan film for the ages. In the very opening moments of Oppenheimer, Christopher Nolan brings up the myth of Prometheus, a titan who stole fire from the gods and gave it to humanity, and we know that it ended with all the horrible consequences. This is in fact the perfect table setter for a three hour biopic thriller about a US tragedy that had all the mythic realism and scope that this story demands. And what comes after is Nolan's most passionate cinematic feat thus far, one that by the end will leave you in complete silence and reflection about the very nature of today's fears. What's remarkable about Oppenheimer is that almost all of it is in conversation. Nolan's able to apply his signature scope, heavy themes, and guilt-ridden perspectives through academic and political figures. We get well-paced scenes of nuclear equations being written on chalkboards, tense discussions between politicians about the war, dire possibilities surrounding a Nazi victory and the potential for a heightened arms race. There's the importance of Oppenheimer's story and McCarthyism issues of the period, whether it be at panels, congressional hearings, or investigations, interrogating the loyalty of these scientists to the United States, and showing us real implications surrounding the atomic bomb's future. And while the intimacy with J. Robert Oppenheimer surrounding all of these ongoing issues takes up less of the running time, the moments we do do spend exploring his thoughts, inject a powerful presence. When we watch Killian Murphy's Oppenheimer Think, we see the particles swirling in his mind and the elemental components being brought forward through his intelligence. And later on in the film, we see the chain reaction, not an atomic explosion, but rather a manifestation of his fears surrounding the aftermath of its power. It's beautiful, but also a horrifying visualization of the power that Oppenheimer directed at the Manhattan Project. To me, it's a miracle how this filmmaker has managed to cover and stay faithful to a large majority of the material in Kai Bird and Martin Sherwin's American Prometheus, yet keep it focused on the man at the very centre and expand beyond the pages to show us what was likely on his mind. Yes, the film moves very quickly through moments in his life and around it too, but it effectively covers the detail and converges multiple narrative threads to tell a more compelling picture. This isn't a slow ticking clock towards destruction, it's a worryingly fast one. We cover Oppenheimer's beginnings as a student, the troubles and brilliance of the Manhattan Project, and then his future battles with the US government over his alleged communist past internally and externally. And the result is a biopic of conversation, one in the vein of say the social network that has all the intensity yet scale of a Nolan classic. It's so appropriate for him because he's a filmmaker that can perfectly merge classical filmmaking with modern sensibilities, creating a visual experience that deals with real world issues. It's sophisticated and tactile, yet also hauntingly messy, and that reflects the central minds that we experience on screen during the three hour runtime. 
Nolan's movie is set right where Oppenheimer's story took a turn, but it primarily acts as a fascinating deep dive into how all the real life figures, yes, had it in them to pull off this monumental effort, but had to live with the consequences after, ones that we all still have to deal with today, especially as the doomsday clock has inched closer to midnight. Nolan chose not to show the devastating consequences of the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and this is exactly how the story plays out in American Prometheus. The more effective choice, which is also taken in the movie, is to show the reaction to it and from Oppenheimer himself. Through the eyes of Oppie and combining brilliant special effects and score, we are reminded of the moral dilemma that Killian's character has to grapple with, mentally and emotionally. It's true that perspective is a huge importance in Oppenheimer, and something that needed intricate thought when it comes to thinking about how the audience would see it and understand the true implications. That victory speech at Los Alamos showcases triumph and tragedy, but it leans more into the latter, becoming a horrifying vision to grapple with. I personally think it's one of the best and most powerful scenes in a Nolan film, and I will be doing a whole separate video on that sometime in the next week. But coming back to my point on perspective, it's not just one man's mind that gives us that deeper look, because the film gives us another viewpoint as well. It's a non-linear telling, moving back and forth between different periods in time, with first-person subjective colour sequences, and then an objective point of view too. The latter, shot in 65mm black and white IMAX film, is from the perspective of Robert Downey Jr.'s Louis Strauss, the commissioner of the US Atomic Energy Commission mission, and eventually the Secretary of Commerce in the Eisenhower administration. With complete precision, we move in and out of these key moments in Oppie's life, whether it's his scientific and political troubles at university, the launch of the Manhattan Project, or his introduction at the Institute for Advanced Study. The weaving throughout these moments in history is not just to make storytelling connections, but it's also structured like this to reflect the scientific detail at the heart of the film. Film. And that is the idea that by creating the right narrative formula, you will get an important chain reaction in the audience. The structure throughout gives the film a sense of added urgency, and it suggests that one event in one narrative thread can affect and result in something years later. For instance, towards the end, when we work out that Strauss was behind Oppenheimer's degrading trials, the film cuts to multiple moments in the film to make it as effective as it was. We see Strauss getting humiliated by Oppenheimer himself, we see how Oppenheimer's trials are then formulated into something more humiliating for him, and then we see the retaliation from scientists at Strauss's hearing years later. It's a perfect structure that allows both the titled sequences of Fission and Fusion to have a much deeper chain reaction. Just to compare a few examples in Nolan's filmography, with Inception we got a narrative structured in dream layers and we saw visually how one layer would affect the other. In Memento, we got two narratives, one backwards in colour and one at the very beginning in black and white, echoing the short-term memory loss that Leonard Shelby suffered with. And in Dunkirk, narratives of land, sea and air all came together, as do the characters, to show a tale of survival in this war-ending ordeal. So Oppenheimer takes this similar approach to structure and takes it to the next level. It uses a story storytelling chain reaction to move you deeply and also to make you feel the sense of disloyalty that Oppenheimer dealt with, both from his country and on a more personal level from Strauss. So while all the material was already there ready to be translated, Nolan expanded upon that history and made it uniquely compelling and important for a modern audience with his particular approach. Communicating the importance of this story is not possible without many of the performances on show, and many of them deliver their career best work, even if they only have limited scenes. Finally, getting a lead role in a Nolan picture, Killian Murphy is outstanding in the role of J. Robert Oppenheimer. He plays him as well as anyone could, showcasing a deeply flawed human being that is one part arrogant, one part rejecting, one part a womanizer, one part deeply concerned, and 
and another part self-absorbing. It doesn't only leave us with all the regret he feels following the events of 1945, but rather a cauldron of feelings. When he sits tragically silent in the room of the trial, almost accepting the unjust punishment that he's receiving, we feel that heavily. There's also this sense of indecision in the many gestures we get from him, and there is of course that burden which is expertly realised when Oppenheimer imagines the devastating potential of this power. It's how Killian channels all the real life descriptions and videos of the man, keeping you on the edge of your seat all the way through. Another performance that drives the film to its inevitable conclusion is that of Robert Downey Jr. unrecognisable and portraying the twisted edge of Louis Strauss. We see parallels and how his fate intertwines with Oppie's over the course of the runtime, with Downey showing that he can really play a unique part in ways he did years ago. As an adaptive counter to Murphy's Oppenheimer, his complex yet relentless performance is one that honestly should be up there for supporting actor come award season. Although they are the two key players in Nolan's latest film, the rest of the huge cast are utilised really successfully on an intellectual and emotional level. Emily Blunt is powerful as Kitty Oppenheimer and she really sells us on why her character was Oppie's perfect match and also why she's the only person who truly knows him. Her testimony in the trial moved me to bits, yet it also brought a small sense of relief as she defended him in a way that only she knew how to. She knew that this was punishment rather than an investigation, so she played them at their own game and absolutely owned Jason Clark's Roger Robb, someone who also gave an underrated performance in those hearing scenes too. It's a riveting moment and Blunt makes a case here why she should also be considered for Best Supporting Actress on the awards circuit. Also, Florence Pugh's Jean Tatlock, who is only in the film for a few scenes, goes beyond her tragic affair with Oppie to make you feel her importance in his story and how her death weighs on Killian's character. Not just that, but during the trial scene vision, her performance really makes you understand the exposing nature of the investigations. Essentially, how Robert and Kitty's life felt naked and analysed to the point of no privacy. Jean's time in the movie is similar to how it is in the book, and I think Florence did an excellent job of conveying all the emotional weight that was needed surrounding her character. And the list goes on and on, whether it be Josh Hartnett, Kenneth Branagh as Niels Bohr, Benny Safdie as Edward Teller, Tom Conti as Albert Einstein, Rami Malek, or an unrecognisable Gary Oldman as President Harry Truman. The scene with him is actually another favourite of mine from the film, just like it was in American Prometheus where you really start to feel how Oppenheimer is fighting a losing battle as he tries to convince the US government to go in a different direction over just building more powerful bombs. It essentially touches on the idea of openness that Niels Bohr inspires versus a sole defensive strategy from the United States. There's iconic moments from all the performers here and it demonstrated to me how one, the script is excellent and two, how these actors really Really did a phenomenal job with each of their individual roles, and that is no matter their length of screen time. On top of the importance of this story, how the performances bring it to life, and the individual scenes that define them, I think what really drives Oppenheimer home is its ending. The final scene, re-shown from Oppenheimer's perspective, while again is an example of that chain reaction approach to the narrative structure, is a moment that leaves you with some of the most crucial questions for our time. With Strauss having misunderstood Oppenheimer and Einstein at that moment near the lake, at the beginning, by the time we do get to it again at the end, we think about the theme of loyalty, how Strauss and the US didn't trust Oppenheimer, and primarily, the fears of nuclear annihilation. Much of Nolan's features end with a prominent message or question, but it's never been as important or impactful to the time we live in now as it is here. The Inception ending questioned reality, and Interstellar proposed the idea of humanity's potential new home. The Dark Knight 
fight further ended with the idea that the hero could take the blame to save the image of a city. And while Oppenheimer in a similar way shows the main character almost taking anything that comes his way as punishment, Nolan decides to end on more of an inconclusive conundrum. Has Oppenheimer stopped future nuclear war because of his creation and the horrifying use of them in Japan decades ago? Or like Oppenheimer implies to Einstein at the very end, have they started a chain reaction because the nuclear arms race has accelerated dramatically? The final idea that he poses is one of real importance because this affects everyone on the planet. If one of these were ever used again, it would compel nations to retaliate and the result is complete annihilation. So Nolan has gone beyond his traditional ending motif and delivered something more crucial for the audience to think about and comprehend. And it becomes even more terrifying because it isn't in our hands to control, similar to how it wasn't in Oppenheimer's hands in the time after he helped create it. As touched on briefly throughout this essay, the great storytelling and ambitious scale is only heightened by the world behind the camera, both in technical ways and thematic ways too. Nolan once again reteams with cinematographer Hoyte van Hoytema using 65mm film and newly created black and white IMAX cameras to yes, create a sense of cinematic scope, but also supremely detailed intimacy. The immersion and magnitude of this world defining narrative is not only shown through wide vistas and some beautiful establishing shots, because the best and most of it is shown through close-ups of Oppenheimer's face. His face becomes a vista in itself and a mirror for the horrors that have been unleashed. There's also frames that reoccur in the movie, and by the time we reach the end, they have a much more horrifying meaning. We see Oppenheimer at the very beginning of the film looking at raindrops in puddles of water, smashing glass in the corner of his room and visualising internally the impacts that molecules and wavelengths can have. And then later on a map we see circled targets combined with that image of dropping water to show how that science that he once imagined has now manifested into his greatest fears. Add on the sharpness of editing by Jennifer Lame and it feels like the gap between an art house film and a large scale film is merged seamlessly. For instance in that Trinity test scene, both the mix of close-up cinematography and the organisation of cuts helps to keep the pulse-pounding suspense. We get hours in time cut down to just a couple of minutes, involving only the appropriate shots that are needed and all the tension that comes with them. While I felt the three hours of the movie, the pace of the editing really keeps you in the film and it refuses to let go. And while the editing and cinematography do stand out, what I think shines the most on the technical side of things is actually the score by Ludwig Göransson. It's music packed full of intense violin notes and recurring motifs to make you hear the character's emotion and the gravitas of this story. Can you hear the music, Kitty Comes to Testify and Trinity are just a few of the tracks that really stood out to me and I think with revisits it may become one of the very best scores in a Nolan film. So from a filmmaker who's tackled so many genres of film and took us to many different landmarks and even fictional places, Oppenheimer takes us into the shoes of a man at the very centre of a changing world. That changing world is heavily connective to the world we still live in today and through Nolan's direction and all the excellent components of his latest work, this may be his most impressive film to date. It's an accomplishment of the highest order and pulling off a dense story like this in the way he has is no easy feat. Some have pointed out that this is a movie with heavy amounts of discussion or talking, and while that is the case, what Nolan has managed to pull off is making that cinematically and thematically compelling in ways I didn't think were possible. He uses the large-scale canvas to capture the breathtaking imagery and put us inside of a man's mind, and the conversations and moments in history around that only elevate the narrative components even more. 
more. It was made in the biggest ways a feature shot on actual film could be, and it was meant for the largest screens possible. But it's also not the conventional large-scale entertainment like most movies are today. Like I said in my spoiler-free review, I think it's a perfect combination of all the big and small in filmmaking. And when you think and learn about Oppenheimer's tale, there's not a better way it could be told, or again, a more challenging way. It has to be challenging, and to make the audience care, you have to try and put them inside of his mind. Overall, I left the film with a lot of questions and feelings about the world we live in, and I think that speaks to the importance of telling this story today. It's a needful reminder that we are still sitting on the explosive power that Oppenheimer created, and we still need to pay attention to these moral dilemmas now more than ever. Nolan has created the ultimate biopic in the mould of a dramatic thriller, and I think it's going to impact many people now, and many others deep into the future. But that was my video discussing why I believe Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer is a cinematic masterpiece. It's my favourite film of the year so far, and I think for many over time, it's going to be one of Christopher Nolan's best works brought to the big screen. It's a relentless cinematic experience that is important, powerful, and thought-provoking. I gave the movie a 9.5 out of 10 in my spoiler-free review the other day, and I'm interested to see how the film will hold up after many more revisits in the future. But let me know down below in the comment section what you thought of Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer, alongside whether you agree with the points I have raised in this video. I will be doing loads more breakdowns and topical uploads on the film, including a biggest questions video in the next few days, so keep a lookout for whenever I post. For much more on Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer, then subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications. Also, if you enjoyed this video, remember to leave a like rating and follow me on social media via the links in the description. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I've been Cortex, and as always, make some noise.